What was the answer to this one? Delta U would be integral of what? You're expanding, right? Changing the volume, so dV from V1 to V2. And your partial derivative here would be partial derivative of U with respect to volume, since you're changing the volume. Isothermal, that means your temperature is constant. Okay? And we said that this was... Uh, okay. And we identified this also before. This was uh, pi sub t, right? This is what we call the internal pressure. Okay, so... Uh, in fact, for a Van der Waals gas, you know what that is, right? What is pi sub t for a Van der, for a Van der Waals gas? Did we derive this before already? This was just a n squared over v squared. Right? This was partial of u with respect to v at constant t. Okay, we haven't actually... This expression, like I said, we can't derive this until we get to the second law, but we did say that this is the expression for partial of u with respect to v at constant t. That's your thermodynamic equation of state, okay? So the expression that says partial of u with respect to v at constant t equals t times partial of p with respect to t at constant v minus p, okay? That's called your thermodynamic equation of state. We'll get to that relationship once we, we've done the second law of thermodynamics. All right, so that is some, and we show that this was equal to a over, a n squared over v squared for a van der Waals gas, right? I remember deriving that to be equal to a n squared over v squared for a van der Waals gas. All right. Okay, so let's move on to enthalpy of a closed system. What if we choose t and p as independent variables? Then we can say that the enthalpy is a function of temperature and pressure. Okay. Uh, in the case of enthalpy, T and P are the convenient are, is a convenient pair of independent variables to choose. So what would be our expression for dH? dH is something times dT plus something times dP. So what's that partial derivative that goes in front of T, Kayla? partial of H with respect to T, dT, okay, and what's the partial derivative that goes in the second one? Partial of H with respect to P at constant and this one's a constant pressure, okay? Now, by definition, H is U plus PV. That's a definition of enthalpy. So we can also write dH equals DU plus D of, P, D of PV, right? Okay. So that's DU plus D of PV. And what do we know about du? It's just equal to dq plus dw. So this thing is du plus dpv. Right. And what if the system undergoes a reversible process at constant p? Then we know that dw is going to be minus pdv. Okay. And what is d of pv? It's just first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. So what happens now? If you add, if you go back to this expression right here, you say dH is equal to dQ, okay, plus dW plus d of PV, so that's going to be equal to dQ 
minus PDV plus, and this one's going to be PDV plus VDP. Right? So you can see that you can cancel PDV. So DH is just going to be equal to DQ plus VDP. So that's an expression for DH. Okay. And so you, uh, uh, what's the significance of that? Uh, significance of that is if your uh, if your pressure is constant, what happens? If pressure is constant, then DP is going to drop out, right? DP is going to be zero, so if, if pressure is constant. So we say DH at constant pressure is equal to DQ at constant pressure. Right? So DH is equal to DQ at constant pressure. That's the same thing we said earlier when we, def when we talked about when we first introduced enthalpy. Uh, the delta H will just be equal to the heat flow if the process happens at constant pressure. All right, but what do we know about DQ at constant pressure? DQ at constant pressure is just integral, uh, uh, it's just equal to what? C sub P dt, right? Remember Q is integral of CP dt, so that tells us that CP must be, uh, CP dt must be DQ, right? At constant pressure. So DQ at constant pressure is CP dt, so that's equal to DH at constant pressure. What does that tell you? That tells us we've got another derivative here that we can easily measure, which is CP. What is CP then? It's partial derivative of H with respect to T. So here, the H dt at constant pressure. So you add that to your list of partial derivatives that you can uh, look up. Partial of H with respect to T at constant pressure. So partial of H with respect to T at constant pressure, that's just CP. Because DQ is CP DT. Right? So partial of H with respect to temperature at constant pressure is C sub P. Let's talk about Joule-Thomson expansion. In a Joule-Thomson expansion, you have... Uh, you have a porous plug here that lets gas through, okay? And here you pump the gas, so you're maintaining a low pressure on this side, and you have a high pressure of gas on this side, okay? So as the gas emerges through the porous plug, it emerges, it goes from a high pressure area to a low pressure area. And so if you can measure the temperature, Okay, so you measure the temperature on this side and you measure the temperature on that side, you can get the difference in your temperature, delta T. Divide that by delta P, the change in pressure. Pressure on both sides are different, right? So if you take the limit of that ratio, delta T to delta P, as delta P approaches zero, you get what's called the joule thomson coefficient. Uh, I think most of some books will just use mu J, mu sub J for that one. But I'm going to use mu jt uh, since we talked about mu sub j as a dual coefficient. Okay, so that partial derivative of t with respect to p at constant h, that's called your dual Thomson coefficient for your gas. Right. So again, using our identities, we can show that the dual Thomson coefficient is partial of t with respect to p at constant h is equal to this expression right here. Where do I get that one? Okay. Remember your permuting identity? Partial of T with respect to P at constant H is equal to uh, times, okay, what do I multiply this with to get negative 1? Uh, me? What's the derivative here? With respect to H at constant T, okay, so P at constant, P with respect to H at constant T. Pull, what's the next derivative here? P 
partial of H oops, partial of H with respect to T at constant right and so if you know, you can solve for partial of T with respect to P at constant H and so this is our joule thompson coefficient okay and um, this is um, I'm gonna write this one using the reciprocal so 1 over partial of H with respect to P at constant T for reasons that will become obvious a little bit later because and then partial of H with respect to T, we just identified that in the earlier slide. What's that derivative? C sub P, right? The capacity at constant pressure equals negative one, okay? So, uh, here's a good way to remember CP and CV. CV is partial of U with respect to T at constant V. CP is partial of H with respect to T at constant P. Okay? So H and P tend to go together, and U and V tend to go together in, what, in, in, in the kinds of derivatives that we deal with. So, um, I can solve for mu JT. The joule times and coefficient is just going to be equal to, what would it be? The joule times and coefficient is equal to par negative partial of H with respect to P at constant T divided by CP. And that's what I have up here. Right? <coughs> And what will happen is, again, later this semester, once we've done the second law of thermodynamics, we can show that this partial derivative right here of H with respect to P at constant T, okay, this derivative right here can be shown to be equal to negative T times partial of V with respect to T at constant pressure plus volume. So what's the nice thing about this expression right here? Everything is pressure, volume, and temperature. Things that are easy to measure, easy to control. So that's an easy thing to calculate, to determine. Okay, so uh, that's another way of writing what we call the thermodynamic equation of state. You're expressing it in terms of things that are, you're expressing U or H in terms of things that are easy to measure or control. Temperature, volume, pressure. Right? So you can see, look at this expression right here. You have everything that you need to solve for the Joule-Thompson coefficient. Of course, you can measure your Joule-Thompson coefficient because you can measure delta T and delta P as well. Right? So, what's the joule Thompson coefficient for an ideal gas? Let's do this for an ideal gas. What do we expect to get from an ideal gas? So, for an ideal gas, PV equals nRT. So, I solve for V equals nRT over P. When am I, why am I solving for B? Because V? Because I want this derivative right here. Partial derivative of V with respect to temperature at constant pressure is what? and R over P. So that's going to be for an ideal gas. So that's going to be negative 1 over CP times negative T times NRT over P. Oops, NR over P. Plus V. And what does that give me? What is negative nRT over P? That's just negative V. So negative V plus V is zero. 
So if you have an ideal gas, your joule Thomson coefficient is going to be zero. What does that, what's the physical significance of that? That's your, uh, remember this is delta partial of T with respect to pressure at constant H, okay? First of all, we need to uh, understand why that's constant H in just a short while because we did talk about why it's constant H. Uh, so what's the significance of that? In a joule thomson expansion, what happens to an ideal gas? As the pressure drops, what happens to the temperature? How can this be, if your pressure changes, how can this derivative be equal to zero if the temperature doesn't change, right? So temperature remains constant as your gas emerges into your low pressure side, okay? Now, why is it constant H? Well, in the joule thomson expansion, in the joule thomson expansion, okay, we're going to make this thing adiabatic. So Q is going to be so Q is going to be zero. You have constant pressure on both sides, so Q sub P is going to be zero. That means your delta H for this process is going to be zero. Okay, regardless of what gas you're putting in there, your delta H for a joule thomson coefficient process expansion would be zero, so you're doing constant H. Okay? So uh, that's what your, um, um, that's why it's a constant H, okay? Process is a constant H. Another way of looking at it is this. Um, Your delta U for this, okay, delta U for this process, okay, is going to be Q plus W, right? And what is Q? I'm sorry, Q plus W. But what is Q for this process? Okay, it's adiabatic, so Q is zero. What's W? Okay, W for the left side plus W for the right side. Okay, what's W for the left side? The left side, you have constant pressure. So minus P, minus PD, minus P, right? And the final volume on the left side is zero. Minus the initial volume on the left side is going to be V1, right? So V sub L. Let's say V sub L is the initial volume on the left side. P sub L is the pressure on the left side. Okay. Plus, what's W on the right side? Negative P for the right side. That's your low pressure. What's the final volume on the right side? What happens when your gas goes from a high pressure side to a low pressure side? You expect it to expand, right? So imagine, in other words, what you imagine, you imagine you have a gas that okay, initially everything's over here on the left side and then it emerges to the other side so it occupies a bigger volume. So uh, the final volume on the right side is V sub R, it's larger, minus the initial volume on the right side is zero. You can think of it that way, okay? So this is going to be equal to uh, P left, V left, okay, Pla uh, plus, minus P R V R, right? But delta U is just U on the right side, that's your final state, right? Minus U on the left side. So if you rearrange this equation, what do you see? You can say see that U right side plus I'm going to move this one over to the left. So PR, VR equals, I'm going to move this over to the other side, U left plus PL, VL. 
So what we're saying is the enthalpy on the right side must be the same as the enthalpy on the left side. So you say H is constant. Okay. So for a joule Thomson expansion, delta H is going to be zero. And we could have just said that that's the case because it's, we, we're setting it up as an adiabatic process. Okay, so that's why in a joule thompson coefficient, the derivative partial of T with respect to P, the variable being held constant there is H. Right? So that's what happens for an ideal gas. What would it be for a van der Waals gas? What do you think is going to happen? What would you need to do to get the joule thompson coefficient for a van der Waals gas? Well, you have to plug in the, num the derivative right here. So what's the expression for the van der Waals gas again? P equals nRT over V minus NB minus AN squared over V squared. So how do I get the derivative? Oops. partial derivative of T with respect to V at constant pressure. I mean V, v with respect to T, I'm sorry. We you can derive it from here, right? It's probably easier to get partial of T with respect to uh, partial of T with respect to V here, right, at constant pressure. And then from that, you just take the reciprocal so you can get partial of V with respect to T at constant pressure. You plug it in, you can get your joule thompson coefficient. And that's not going to be zero, OK? So what happens if your uh, joule thompson coefficient, what would be the significance of the algebraic sign of a joule thompson coefficient? What if your what if it turns out your joule thompson coefficient is positive? What does that mean? As the pressure drops, remember joule thompson coefficient is basically delta T over delta P, right? What happens in a joule expansion? What's your delta P? Is it positive or negative? Pressure drops. So what's your delta P? Negative. So how can your joule thompson become positive? What should what would be your delta T then? It would also be negative. So if your gas expands, okay, undergoes joule thompson expansion, and it the temperature drops when it when that happens, then you say you have a positive joule thompson coefficient. Okay? If the temperature increases while it expands, then you're having you have you're dealing with a negative joule thompson coefficient. What's the application for this? Refrigerators. Remember, uh, you've heard of refrigerators having a compressor. So what happens in a compressor is your uh, flow rate or your, your gas is pressurized, and then it's allowed to expand into a low pressure chamber. Okay. So as the gas expands, it cools down. So, so it cools down into that. And so that, and your, what your refrigerator does is cycles that uh, gas through the compressor. So every time it emerges out of your compressor, it cools down. And so that's how you get your refrigerator to work. Okay. So it draws heat from one side and dumps it to the outside of the refrigerator. Okay, so isothermal expansion of an ideal gas, what's delta H? partial of H with respect to V at constant T. Let's relate that to partial of H with respect to P at constant T. Plus, what derivatives go here? Can remember? No, that's not what you need, right? It's two different derivatives. Okay. Uh, 
what do we need here? V with respect to T equals partial of H. How, how is it related to partial of H with respect to T? <coughs> partial of P with respect to volume at constant temperature, chain rule, right? What do we know about partial of H with respect to P at constant T? What did we just show that to be? If we go back, yeah. Partial of H with respect to P right here. Partial of H with respect to P at constant T is equal to negative T partial of V with respect to T at constant P plus V. What, what is that for an ideal gas? Okay. V equals NRT over P, right? So partial of V with respect to T at constant pressure is NR over P, right? So this is NR over P. So that's negative T times NR over P plus volume. So what's that? Negative volume plus volume, that's zero, right? What we're saying is the enthalpy doesn't depend on pressure at constant temperature. So, going back over here, what do we get then? So this is going to be zero times whatever partial of P with respect to V is at constant temperature. So, that's going to be equal to zero. So, that means what's delta H if a gas expands under constant temperature? going to be zero, right? So delta H at constant temperature, if the gas expands from P1 uh, from P1 to P2, partial of H with respect to T at constant uh, with respect to pressure at constant temperature, that's just going to be zero. Okay. In fact, we know the value for delta U for this one also before it's also going to be zero, right? Why is that? We know delta U is zero previously, right? Constant temperature, we've already shown that delta U is going to be zero for an ideal gas, a for an isothermal process involving an ideal gas. So you can say, all right, delta H, you could have, a, you could, you could have solved it differently. You could have said delta U is equal to uh, Okay, remember H is U plus PV, right? So, delta H, another way to approach this is to say delta H equals delta U plus delta PV. But what's delta U? We've already shown that to be zero. So, it's zero plus delta PV. What do we know about PV for an isothermal process, ideal gas? Boyle's law. P1, V1 equals P2, V2, right? Isothermal, ideal gas. So delta PV is also going to be zero. So that's another way of showing delta H is equal to zero for an isothermal process involving an ideal gas. Okay? And so that's the end of that, and that would be the last topic for your first test.